Okay, everybody, we're about to uh, get started with our next conversation here. So if you all would uh, take your seats and we're going to get going. So in the West, uh, in the West, many of our rural communities are closely tied uh, to natural resources uh, and the extractive industries, which has led to periods of extreme uh, boom and bust with the changing for fortunes of the mining and energy and forestry sectors. Uh, many communities are now dealing with uh, big changes in the energy industry. Uh, coal mines and coal-fired power plants are closing in many parts of the West. At the same time, new extraction technologies have uh, fueled, fueled uh, booms in uh, oil and gas. So the scale and pace of change in resource dependent communities can be extreme, uh, but the lessons that we can learn from those communities should be applicable to all communities in the rural West that are dealing with uh, today's economic trends, such as increased automation and the shift to more of a service-based economy. So our panel, our panelists, our discussion leaders, uh, represent communities dealing with different phases of transition. And they're going to help us uh, share, they're going to share their experiences to help us understand what communities can do to better prepare for the inevitable change uh, in their communities. Um, what does a resilient community look like? Uh, what kind of investments can be made today to support long-term prosperity? And how can state and federal policies help those communities that are, that are dealing with drastic changes that are beyond their control? Uh, our panelists today are Kent Wilson, a county commissioner, commissioner from Emory County, Utah, Daniel Stenberg, economic development coordinator from McKenzie County, North Dakota, Arvin Trujillo, CEO of Four Corners Economic Development in San Juan County, New Mexico, and Jack Morgan, Community and uh, Economic Development Program Manager for the National Association of Counties. So I'm going to ask uh, each of you to start by giving us an overview of your community and the work you're doing uh, to adapt to change and to become more resilient. So, Kent. Good afternoon. First off, I'd like to uh, say thank you for the invitation. As, as was said, I'm a county commissioner. I've been there for about two years. Um, my county is in eastern Utah. We have been a coal mining community and power generation, uh, coal mining for over 100 years. Uh, I personally have four generations of coal miners in my family. In the last seven years, we've, we've went from a population of 12,000, and, and now we've bottomed out at about 10,000. And so we've lost 2,000 of our residents, and that's due to uh, coal mine closures. Uh, the last couple of years, we, we have been told that our coal mines or our power plants have an end of life, and that is roughly 2036 <coughs> and 2042. And so we've got a 15 to 20 year window to become something. About six months into my tenure, our economic development person, uh, the state of Utah, stole them and, and, and are using them to, uh, he went to work for the university. And so it put us into a situation that was kind of tough. And what we realized is our economic development directors for the last 20 or 30 years, we get them, we, we get them educated up two or three years and then somebody comes along and steals them. And it's mainly been the universities. And so what we've decided to do is take a different path. Uh, we, through Utah Association of Counties, Brandy Grace, uh, we've tried to, we're, we're looking at it as more of a regional basis. And so we've partnered with a sister county, Carbon County, uh, just to the north of us, there's mainly a coal mining community as well. And we've, we've through uh, Utah Association of Counties, we have hired, uh, his name is Stuart Clayson, and, and he is representing both counties and going out and, and we're doing it as a region. And we've found some success. We've been doing that for a year. We've been strengthening partnerships through uh, Association of Governments. Uh, just two months ago, we had a local company, electronics company, Intermountain Electronics, that announced that they are going to expand, and over the next 10 years, they will create 300 jobs. So that was a, a great first year. And the local, or our state governor's office, uh, uh, economic development office, helped participate with state incentives, with local incentives. Uh, we were successful. 
And, and so we're off to an exciting start. We are finding new partnerships and, and, and we're excited and, and thank you. Great, thanks Scott. Dan? Uh, so McKenzie County is at the far west side of North Dakota, right in the middle of the Bakken Shale play. And so come 2010, uh, we just had a lot of changes that we didn't know what was going to happen. But uh, since 2010, we've gone up about 300% in population. We were, when I was growing up there, it was 1,500 people. We're now 7,000 on our way to maybe 15,000 people for our town. Our county has doubled about in population. And it's obviously um, brought about a lot of infrastructure challenges. 2013, 2014 was really the boom years, and we ju and we just had did not have the infrastructure built out for that. Thankfully, in the past few years, we've been able to get a bypass built around town. We've been able to get water, uh, good water supply um, to our community. But we're still we're still looking for more workers. We did face a little bit of a downturn with the uh, with with the oil prices going down in 2014, 2015, but all of the services have only um, increased. We've never decreased in school enrollment um, since 2000. In 2005, we were maybe 500 students. And now we're up to 2,000 students in our school system. So we've had to build new schools and different things like that. It's been a challenge, but it's, it's better than the alternative. I thought I would end up in North Dakota. I lived in Washington, D.C. for five years, but I didn't think I would end up in, back in my hometown, but I lived two miles from where I grew up. My sister moved home. My brother moved home, which wasn't that big of a surprise because he's on the home ranch. But it's just, um, it's just kind of a fun atmosphere to be in because it's, you, it's the familiarity of having grown up there, but then it's the newness of all of these people moving in. And so I just uh, I appreciate being able to be in this position and try to manage this growth um, because it is some good opportunities, but, it, but it's still a lot of challenges for a lot of people as well. Arvin. Uh, thank you, and again, I want to thank everybody here for allowing me the opportunity to come present to you. Uh, in the Four Corners area, it, Right now, we're focused within San Juan County, New Mexico. But as I said earlier, we're really looking at the Four Corners region because uh, the energy industry, coal, oil, and gas, affects the full region and how the full region has been able to prosper over the years. And again, we're looking at challenges coming down the road, much like uh, Mr. Wilson sees there in, U in Utah uh, with San Juan Generating Station right now destined to close in 2022. Uh, Four Corners Power Plant may be looking at 2031. Uh, Navajo Generating Station out in Page is looking at the end of this year. Uh, Choya Power Plant's looking at 2025. So what has been really the, uh, the economic drivers in the, in the whole region there is transitioning at this point. And one of the things that we've, we've capitalized on, looking at where things are, ha what's happening with oil and gas as well as with coal is really forging partnerships, really looking at the four corners area to say, okay, how do we begin to work together? I've been in this position now going on six months. I'm a mining engineer by education and by my first career. I worked for the Navajo Nation for 12 years. I've, I've done a number, I've worked for a power plant for another 10, so I've seen uh, many different aspects looking at the energy, uh, energy area. But looking at what we're really forging with uh, partnerships is how do we bring the full region together looking at economic development and getting the local uh, communities to begin to participate and understand that they also are a part of economic development. Everybody has a tendency to look at things and say, well, it, that's the state's problem or that's Four Corners Economics problem, or that's the county's, or that's the municip municipality's problem. But what it is, it's really the community's challenge to begin to figure out how we can uh, begin to branch out and develop accordingly. Really what we've been doing is, one of the big things we did was the Four Corners Future Forum. We were able to bring the four states together in that region, as well as uh, four of the seven tribes. We first one we had, we had 140 participants. The second one, we had about 100. From there, we began to develop the priorities for the region. 
we began to do surveys, we began to do outreach within the region because the people there in the four corners, we don't recognize the boundaries. Everybody else seems to recognize the boundaries, but we don't. We shop, we go, we go to entertainment, we do different things throughout the four corners area. And we begin to, and we also share with one another in that aspect. And so building on that, we've been really focusing on developing those partnerships and figuring out how do we begin to work with each other. Uh, because qu quite frankly, even though we're within the same proximity of one another, we don't know how to play with each other. And so we're learning that aspect and, it, and we're beginning to grow and develop in that aspect. Real quickly, we've got a Four Corners uh, Regional Broadband Initiative that we're working on now. We've got a petrochemical industrial site as well as bringing a railroad into San Juan County, looking at that and looking at how that would also benefit the four states region. And we're also looking at how we can utilize energy, looking at value added type products, looking at uh, natural gas into, petro into petrochemicals, looking at coal and coal uh, sequestration, looking at new initiatives on those, on those areas. So again, there's a lot happening within the Four Corners area and we're really uh, looking at new ideas and new areas to begin to develop our mark here in the Four States region. Because again, it, it's becoming vital for us if we're gonna to continue to prosper and to continue the type of quality of life that we see in the region. Great, thanks. Jack. Great, well thanks Jim, and, and it's great to be here uh, in New Mexico. Uh, I'm Jack Morgan, uh, Program Manager with the National Association of Counties, NACO. Um, just quickly for background information for those that aren't familiar, so uh, NACO is a, a membership-driven organization uh, based in Washington, D.C., and we represent the 3,000 69 county governments uh, across the country and some 40,000 uh, county leaders uh, from America's counties from commissioners such as uh, Mr. Wilson to county staff as well uh, like Daniel. Um, we uh, and I would also of course like to mention that uh, New Mexico is a hundred percent membership state so thank you for your membership and, and we do also have great membership across the West and, and work very well with with WGA so again great to be here. I uh, always learn so much more uh, than you guys will learn from me, uh, I'm sure. Um, but uh, as you might imagine with the association, um, we do advocacy uh, on Capitol Hill uh, for, with a United County voice, re kind of representing county interests uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, but my team uh, is, is what's called the County Innovations Lab. Uh, so we're more of the uh, best practice technical assistance uh, wing. Uh, we also do data and, and research and mapping. Uh, I would encourage you all to, to check out uh, our County Explorer site uh, uh, if you're really into maps and data. We've got data and maps on, on all the 3,069 counties. Um, but, but really I work on a lot of the community econ development and some energy uh, best practices, technical assistance, organizing peer exchange uh, events such as this. So really connecting county leaders to each other so um, you know, th they can really learn from each other. That, that's kind of our mantra is we really believe that that county leaders uh, have a lot to offer and, and as far as peer exchange and, and we are here to provide guidance and, and, and mentoring uh, and really connect with thought leaders and experts but we really feel that bringing county leaders together, they, they have a lot to learn. Uh, so we have done a lot of that uh, since 2015 in this space of economic resilience, particularly uh, looking at uh, resource extraction uh, economies uh, and mostly uh, looking at uh, America's coal communities. Uh, so, uh, for those that, that aren't familiar, kind of nationwide, a lot of it is here in the West. Uh, there are uh, over 150 counties that uh, ha are coal producing across the country. Uh, as said, obviously there's a big band here in the West, uh, of course, and then Appalachia uh, on the East, uh, another major part. And then more nationwide, there's over 330 counties that, are, that have coal-fired power plants. Uh, so with changing conditions in uh, in the coal industry, that is a significant burden, obviously, for jobs, as we all know. But for county governments themselves, that is huge for, for tax revenue and, and a big concern uh, for county governments themselves. Uh, so we developed a, a peer exchange uh, uh, and kind of thought leadership uh, uh, peer learning uh, program since 2015 to directly support coal-impacted counties uh, and regions. We partnered with the National Association of Development Organizations uh, to really look at coal-reliant communities and, and how they can 
uh, become more resilient economies, as that's the, what was mentioned earlier. How can uh, you react and respond to changing uh, conditions and, and be more, uh, have more economic diversification, so not be so overly reliant uh, on that one industry. Um, I, I would like to say, too, of, of course, that I mentioned Appalachia, and this is obviously Western uh, focus, but I think the Western states ha do have a lot to learn from Appalachia, particularly of the coal reliant communities and how they can hopefully get ahead of uh, the curve and, and learn from Appalachia as far as over-reliance on, on any one industry. And so we have always brought someone from Appalachia coal reliant communities to, to our Western events to, to help in that peer exchange and uh, would have to, to mention that that is my homeland and so that's my personal background in, in coal reliant communities uh, is from being Appalachian, Virginia, if, if you're wondering where the heck is this guy from with his accent. But um, with that, I'll, I'll pass it back over to, to you, Jim. Good, uh, thanks, Jack. Uh, Kent, you, you mentioned the population reduction. I think you said the, the county population went from 12,000 to 10,000. Who are the 2,000 on the left? Or is it mostly young people? Who's leaving? And, and where, are they go, where are they going, if you know? Well, three, three of the... Three of them were my sons, <laughs> and they went to coal mines in, in Wyoming. Uh -huh. And so Wyoming and, and North Dakota, uh, gas as well. And, and so they were uh, young families uh, that were important to our economy. So when, when you lose one job, there were three to five that went with them. And has uh, Emory County started to embrace tourism as an alternate industry? And, and what, what resources or technical assistance have you needed to uh, pursue that? Well, roughly 11 months ago, we passed our public lands bill where we uh, set aside roughly about 400,000 acres for recreation in the San Rafael Desert and about 650,000 acres for wilderness. And it was quite controversial. Uh, there were a lot in my county that uh, felt like th there is no room for wilderness. Uh, but at the end of the day, we felt like it was necessary to get that public lands bill passed, so we had created some certainty. Businesses don't want to come into a community that, we're 92% we're federal and state properties, land, and, and that created some uncertainty. We didn't know what, where that was gonna lead. Our fear was as a president was gonna come in and make a designation and just do away with energy completely. And, and so we're in the beginning stages of tourism. Our, uh, visitation to our desert is probably up three or fourfold. Uh, the problem I have is our little town of Green River, they probably generate about $600,000 a year in TRT revenue. But most of the vis visitation is on our desert. And, and, and so when we spend a dollar for uh, tourism and we get that person to come, most of the revenue goes to a different county. And so we're working, we've got a, a local family that's going to create a $2 million KOA type business. We've got another family that is looking at creating a uh, Polaris ATV rental type business and we're hoping to have them going in the next, uh, next year. My county has been slow to embrace tourism. They want the desert and the mountain for themselves. And, and so, uh, it's been a slow process, but when they closed that first power plant in Carbon County two years ago, it opened everybody's eyes. And when three coal mines closed, uh -huh. it's changed attitudes. Right. Are there other industries that are you're pursuing or there, that seem tenable for the counties? It's interesting. We have a, a, a group of counties, or seven of us, and it's called Southern County Coalition. And about two years ago, there was a a professor from BYU that came and made a presentation about thorium nuclear power. And so my county, we took that serious. We went out and bought a 20,000 square foot uh, building that was vacated by the coal mines. And it was, uh, it cost us a half million dollars. And we raised our hand and said, here we are. And since then, uh, our senator has gotten us a uh, million dollars from the legislature to go towards nuclear research. Uh, he also helped us get a coal combustion machine from the University of Utah that they were going to scrap. In their eyes, coal is going this way. Uh, for us, we're not going to give up on it. And so we've created this research facility that we've gotten over $4 million in the last year, and we have high hopes for it. 
Well, good luck with that. Daniel, you're on the other side of the population coin. So talk about the, the, the population boom and, and who, who's, who, who's been moving uh, to your counties? Uh, are they temporary workers? Are you seeing more uh, families moving permanently? And, and what are families looking for when they consider uh, moving to McKenzie County or Watford County? Yeah, traditional, or probably 2011 to 2013, 2014, it was pretty much just the worker that was moving. And it was usually um, a man, and he left his wife at home. And, um, and then you kind of work here for work in our county for a couple weeks and then be off for a week back, back home. Now, that has transitioned, especially for those that did have families, and they are like, okay, yep, this is a real job. And so they've been bringing their families here. And so then that's obviously impacted our school system and our housing situation as well. Um, housing has been is one of our biggest challenges right now, just with, um, I mean, our apartments are pretty much full, and our single-family housing is just difficult to get built. Um, our FHA loan limit amount is 315000 and builders come to us and say that we, they can't build for a build a new house for 300 and they need a, probably like 360 and so it's not meeting that FHA limit so then people can't build houses or people aren't buying the houses and so the county has stepped in through our job development authority and we're subsidizing the difference um, between the FHA amount and um, and, and the amount that the builders are needing in order to make it an economic venture. And so, uh, but also all the other quality of life things, we put in a, a 265,000 square foot um, conference center and event center that has, um, it provides recreation opportunities, a couple sheets of ice. We get, we don't have a college in town, but, but People are really liking that, and they're bringing their college teams and come play, and we like it because they're entertaining us. We're a pretty big ho uh, hockey um, town. But so we're just trying to, I mean, so we've had a lot in our schools. We've been blessed with, we've been passing all of our bonds for getting new schools, other areas um, that have been affected by the oil development. They are more skittish about investing for the long term, but so our schools are, um, are growing rapidly, but we're able to have uh, the kids for the most part in permanent structures. And that's because that's what we're seeing that people are asking for is that they want, they, they want, and, then, and that's, and they, because people choose, sometimes they choose location first and then they find their job after that. And so we are trying to stay on that cutting edge of what we can do to make, um, make our area a good place to live, not just have a good paying job, but you have to have a good place to live. It's tricky, but we're, we're working on it. And, and what else might uh, Mackenzie County be doing to address its workforce shortages? You still have uh, workforce shortages, right? Oh, very much so, yes. I mean, we, um, so we, we have tried the education uh, upskilling type thing because we found that it's much, much better if somebody's from, what, from our area and then they get a job, they're much more likely to stay than people that maybe move from Texas in November um, without a jacket. And then they realize, oh, it's cold up here, you know, and th <laughs> things like that. They're just not used to kind of all of, all of our unique cultural um, things. And so we've tried to, uh, we're, we meet quarterly. Um, our group gets together with the high school, with, two, with community college, with a private university, and then the, the petroleum industry, and we just say, hey, what are you guys seeing? What can we, um, what should we be doing more? And we're kind of, it looks like we're, folk, we're gonna be heading towards a career academy concept anyway, and I'd be, I'd love to talk with anybody who's had more experience with a career academy concept, because we're just in the feasibility, um, we're looking to do a feasibility study, but I'd like to, learn more about how that all works because um, because we see if we can grow our own, it's much better than kind of importing, but we'll take anybody who's willing to come work for us yeah, in our you. area. So, so Arvin, uh, you mentioned a number of facilities in the Four Corners region. I'm most familiar with uh, the Navajo Generating Station. I used to work for Salt River Project, by the way, so I've been through that. And, and I, I, what an extraordinary facility, and you've got the, uh, the coal mine that's dependent on operation of, of NGS. Um, and very unique facilities. And the, the, the what is it, Black Mason Powell, uh, Lake Powell Railroad uh, was one of three 50 kilovolt electric lines in the entire world. Uh, it's, it, so 
with, the, with those closures, um, you're going to have to do a lot of reimagining uh, of those facilities in that area. How do you reimagine re it? Again, looking at uh, our focus, as we begin to forge our partnerships and develop those partnerships, we're looking at how we can really focus on infrastructure development. That's one thing uh, we've been, we haven't really looked at because of the, the, uh, the steady nature of coal and oil and gas in, in the past, in the, in the fact that coal was very steady, oil and gas would go up and down, but the communities, when you saw a downturn in the economy, you would always say, well, oil and natural gas will come back, and it usually did, and you started to see an uptick again within the region. Well, those things have changed, and much like some of the other panelists noted, uh, as people begin to recognize that there's a new, a new mindset coming forward, and we're looking at how we can focus on infrastructure development in the region. One of the big things in that in San Juan County, they've talked for decades about getting a railroad to connect the I-40 corridor. Well, we're we're finally getting uh, good uh, discussions with the Navajo Nation to really figure out how we might be able to do that. And we're looking at the, having further discussions with other tribes surrounding the area, looking at what can we do or how can we begin to work with one another in the region, and how do we begin to look at things such as broadband development. Looking at food hubs, we got the Nappy uh, Commercial Farm, the Ute Mountain Utes want to look at commercial farming operation. We got the farming uh, uh, infrastructure in place in Dove Creek, Colorado. Again, there, there are opportunities there that we really haven't taken hold of. Uh, we're looking at uh, our Four Corners marketing as well as outdoor recreation and how do we begin to brand that aspect, how do we look at cultural development. But again, it's looking at that partnership aspect and saying how do we work with each other in order to forge that. And much of our initial efforts have been based off of the work that was done in central Minnesota by Region 5 and bringing a five county region together and really getting the communities and the constituency within those communities together to start looking at economic to, uh, development as a collective group. And so that's where we are right now because you have a lot of uh, uh, competitiveness between communities uh, in past uh, instances, you've had differences of opinion. You've had things that have happened in the past, but again, we're beginning to get past those issues and start looking at how do we become beneficial to one another. The other aspect is tying education to this whole package. We have Fort Lewis College, we have San Juan College, we have uh, Navajo Technical University, we have uh, uh, the NEC College, and so again, forging the discussions between those institutions as to how do we begin to look at workforce capacity, workforce development, and how do we connect with our local communities because we're also focused on retention and expansion. We've had some of our companies been successful in expanding their businesses, looking and training new operators and new individuals, and even in our uh, power plants, getting that education forward to our young people because the power plants right now also have a high retirement uh, uh, level at this point in time. For instance, at Four Corners right now, the current workforce that's in place, you've got about 450 people working there at Four Corners. About 50% are eligible for retirement. And so we're looking at continuing operations to 2031. How do we prepare those individuals to take those positions? And so again, there are a number of things that we're looking at, but it all stems from that aspect of partnership and building on those partnerships, whether we're tribal or non-tribal. How do we come together to work, work these things through? To, to what extent will some of those closures create opportunities for environmental mitigation and land reclamation activities? Uh, say that again. So, so you've got these these big facilities that are closing. Are there will will, will there be jobs created to uh, reclaim the land and and mitigate some of the environmental impacts? Yes. Uh, looking at uh, those facilities on the Navajo Nation, you would have uh, full reclamation on those aspects because it's written within their lease that they will take down those power plants as well as the mines completely once they uh, cease operation. So they would have full 
reclamation in, that, in, in those areas. Uh, as far as San Juan generating is concerned, you wouldn't, right now that the, uh, the thought is that that plant wouldn't come down fully, the mining operation would that's associated with it. Uh, but again, the idea here is how do you begin to sustain that employment aspect? And in this case, you're looking at employment anywhere from five to eight years to, to finish reclamation. And Four Corners has gotten experience, the APS has, in that aspect because they've shut down three of the units and they've completely reclaimed those three units down to the ground. So they have a good, op good outlook as to how that will all work. Wow. And so taking those three units down took about three years to, to, to reclaim those areas. So again, you have those opportunities there, but we're looking at how do we begin to build and look forward into the future for new opportunities. Well, uh, Jack, how do we do that? How do we sustain these economies post-closure? What lessons have you learned in your work with coal dependent communities that would be broadly applicable to the West? Sure, H happy to share some, some top level uh, lessons learned uh, from, from our travels across coal reliant communities. And, and like you said, Jim, I, th I think it would be referable for all rural communities, at least that's, that's what we feel. And, and you can learn much more about some of this that we've done, uh, failed to mention, we, we developed a, a web portal called diversifyeconomies.org, um, as well as uh, an ongoing newsletter. Um, get with me afterwards if you wanna subscribe to the newsletter. It has some great county examples and, and doses of inspiration. Um, but I like to kind of describe, it's, it, it frames the challenge and then what needs to be done kind of broadly for, for coal reliant co communities kind of twofold. And a lot of this um, I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with and our panelists kind of already alluded to the, some of them in an example. Uh, so the twofold is we, we've got to act and execute in the short term, particularly if there's a, a resource economy decline, while at the same time planning for uh, the future, uh, looking ahead, you know, which is always tough, 20, 30 years for what the economy is going to be and, and what the workforce is going to be, and then what your community uh, is going to look like and how it can, can, can play a role in, in that economy of the future. Uh, and so within that, uh, there's obviously the workforce piece, as well as what I like to then call kind of this investments in place strategies or asset-based strategies. So kind of what that looks like then is, so for acting in the, uh, the now, the, the react now, so for a workforce example, that's retraining uh, or quickly kind of taking skills that uh, someone who's displaced has and, and being able to match them with the, another occupation. So being nimble with your community college perhaps and, and finding uh, another niche sector to pursue that uh, someone from say the coal industry uh, already has uh, relative background and skills that they can then uh, transfer to whether that's looking at uh, you know, drone technology. Some communities have, have looked at that with a, a community college partnership. Uh, uh, looking at uh, aerospace, uh, uh, even in, in, obviously not in the West, in Kentucky, uh, some communities have looked at uh, more of technology and, and training miners, miners to code. Um, is, if you're familiar with mining now in the 21st century, it's obviously not uh, pick and ax, and, and they always say that, that coal miners are just tech workers that get dirty. So um, there, there's opportunity there. That's just an example of, of, of being nimble and reacting, and then looking at the workforce for the future, got to be working with uh, the K-12 and, and your higher education systems to, to make sure that uh, the next generation uh, is skilled for the jobs of the future and that uh, then moving to investments in place, do they want to live in your community? And so uh, regardless of, uh, as I always like to say, regardless of what's going on with the resource economy such as coal, like investments in place such as uh, downtown revitalization or promoting entrepreneurship and small business, uh, capitalizing on say your natural resource assets, uh, tourism was mentioned. You know, this is general good practice uh, no matter what, even if times are, are great uh, in, the, in a resource economy, but certainly uh, a great opportunity to, to pursue. Uh, and it builds a good framework for, uh, as Jim was talking about earlier, attracting those 30 or 40 year olds back to your community uh, where they wanna live with that quality of place, uh, in addition to hopefully retaining some of your, your younger generation or, or bringing them back uh, from college. You know, that, that's so, key now that uh, it's not always the, the jobs come first, it's oftentimes you know, the, the, uh, the place based, which I think we're going to hear a little bit about in next panels about culture and heritage and, uh, and, and, resource, uh, and natural resources. 
Uh, and so how, how do we get there? You know, again, this is just going to be very broad. It's just some tips that, that, that we always like to share. And again, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with these, and it might re reassure uh, that you guys are on the right track. Um, do your research. Uh, I mentioned data before, and obviously we have a great uh, data site that I like to brag on. But uh, also, you need to take an assessment of, of your community, uh, honest assessment of, of your workforce. And I think I would reference a, a, a site called Stats America, if you're not familiar with that. Uh, give that a, a check. It's kind of a one-stop economic development data uh, portal uh, that EDA developed. But within that, they have what's called the cluster mapping uh, feature. So you can really look at your current workforce and see what it might pair up with uh, for, for other sectors that, that you already have a relatable workforce. So um, going back to, to what I said um, earlier. And then, you know, I said assets. That, that's so key of what we stress. And we really see that uh, successful communities are not dwelling on their gaps or their negatives uh, and really looking to their assets. Uh, every community has assets. Uh, you may not know it, uh, but every community does have assets and, and it's really important that you can uh, to really stress those and build off of those. Uh, and then relatable for maybe communities that don't know they have assets or they're not really uh, sure what direction to go in. Uh, obviously we know that planning is, is, is very critical. Uh, and, and a piece that we always encourage is to add some accountability or, uh, you know, Jim, you were mentioning, uh, you know, we, we can have these best practices but not always move to action. And so that was one piece that we added in, in our programming with our teams of Coalerline communities is to, to develop an action plan. So you take what you may have learned from other communities or education, but really uh, meet as a group, develop a, a kind of small group within your community. Uh, and then chart out an action plan and, and who will be accountable and responsible and play a role and, and maybe add a rough timeline for that. And, and Arvin and Commissioner uh, Wilson have, have gone through that process as, as a part of uh, our, our programming uh, as well. Uh, and add diverse, diverse people to this uh, group that as you do on go through planning. Uh, talk too often it's a, it's a mayor, no offense to mayors that are here, or uh, an economic development professional, but bring in folks that, that aren't from traditional economic development, and they may, they may just be a champion uh, in your community that, uh, that really knows the community and, and, and has some great ideas. And, and lastly on that too is, is bring in young people, and, and I would, you know, just often if I have time, are there communities out here that, that are actively engaging their young people in planning? Because um, if you're not, you should, and, and I don't mean to be on like a millennial soapbox here and, and we know what, what to do and you know, you're not thinking of us. Uh, it's, it's really just about, because that's the future of, of your community and, and it, it, uh, why would you not want to engage with uh, folks in school currently that live in your community of, as far as uh, do you, what would make you want to live in your community? What do you love about your community? Um, what jobs do you want to do and do you think that could be uh, here in, in this county? And so that. That's one thing that, that I uh, uh, have, are, am pushing for when we work with our communities and, and seeing some success with. Uh, Arvin mentioned partnership, and sorry if I'm going over. Wow. Uh, Arvin's uh, always talking about partnership and playing together. That's, of course, what, what we love to, to stress, uh, cooperate. And, and of course, cooperate can mean both within your community, too. You don't want to have uh, folks within your community not on the same page, and that's what the planning process is for, uh, but also Co cooperate with, with neighboring counties, and that's why the Utah folks, that's a great example of, of the two counties partnering together, is economies don't know political boundaries or, or, or county boundaries, and so it's, partnership uh, there is huge. Uh, think about also, if you're not familiar with WealthWorks and the other forms of wealth or capital, uh, I see some nodding faces, so it's, it's not just all jobs. Think about other assets and wealth in your, and capital in your community. There's there's a whole slew of them, but one thing I will note is social capital. Uh, so uh, really being able to connect people together and, and these group, group meetups and, and community events are awesome for that. Uh, that. That's great for a quality of place and attractive, but it's also huge for finding a job. Uh, oftentimes, and, and this may be happened to many of you all, uh, you, you find a job and don't even go through application process just from connections of uh, your friends within your community, or I know a, a job that I heard you got laid off from the mine industry. You can you move on to this opportunity. Um, and I can go into a lot more of that, but I want to be cognizant of, of time. And, and so I'll leave you with, it with one uh, piece, and maybe we're still on kind of baseball World Series high <laughs> here in D.C. With our, with our nationals. But I always like to uh, use the baseball analogy of, of hit for singles and not home runs. Uh, and in the economic development 
since uh, to try to get jobs back uh, through singles. Uh, if you're an old baseball guy, you know you want to hit the singles, advance the runners over, and score your runs like that. And it is great that you can get a home run, such as a 300 job, you know, piece there in, in, in Carbon County. Uh, but that doesn't always happen. And, and so hit, hit those small singles, three jobs, five jobs at a time, and celebrate those uh, as well. Yeah. Well, if the Nationals uh, hadn't hit home runs, this would have been a longer summer season. <laughs> Um, so I, I want to open up the conversation in the entire room. So, so if you have a, a, a question or a comment or a, an ex experience in your resource-dependent community, we'd love to hear about it. Bill Simons, hold, hold for an, a microphone. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. I'm really enjoying this panel. I'd sort of like to turn the conversation on its head. Maybe there are some people in the audience who would like to jump in as well. So the title is Resilient Rural Resource Economics. And what occurs to me is how resilient the resource industries have been in the West. I've been following this for the last 30 years. Back in the light, late 1980s, uh, the board of Exxon voted to close down um, the uh, uh, shale oil plant they were building in uh, the western slope of Colorado. It was a $2 billion project, and they showed up with a padlock one Sunday afternoon and, and shut the whole thing down. And at the time, people thought the shale industry was dead. But now we just heard uh, you know, it came roaring back to life in, in North Dakota uh, and, and several other places around the U.S. because the economics of shale uh, changed. If you look at the gold industry, you know, people thought that was played out. But then uh, Barrick Gold figured out a new way of mining micro deposits of gold. Uh, the Gold Strike mine outside of Elko, Nevada, is now the largest gold mine in the world. It's been going for a long time. There's thousands of jobs up there. And if you look at copper, the same thing has happened. You know, the copper industry, people thought that was played out in Arizona. Right now in Superior, Arizona, which is basically a ghost town, uh, they are planning to make the largest investment in the history of Arizona. Uh, to open the Resolution Copper Mine, it's just an, a massive project. So I think what this suggests is the, the, res the West is so resource rich that um, it may not com be coming back in your communities, but it seems like the history has been that um, the world is, is getting larger every day. We're going to need these resources, and um, somebody's going to have to develop in the West. In other words, I don't think the message should be that, that the resource era is done. Uh, it, it'll take different forms, but those, those examples, I think, are really striking of, of what's happened. And I don't know if we have anybody here from the mining industry that might have some thoughts on, on what's going on. Let's go back here. Thank you. Uh, in the United States, because we have split a state for the surface and mineral ownership, which is the only country in the world that does. Uh, we have 12 million mineral owners in the United States. Uh, because those minerals have been severed so much, many of the people, the young adults that have left your counties have inherited minerals uh, from their parents, grandparents, and still have a strong economic interest in your county. I, I know for a fact McKenzie County a large portion of the royalty checks that goes out are to people that don't live in McKenzie. So there are a lot of people that have left, a lot of young people that have left, that still have a very strong economic tie back to your counties through mineral resource. Uh, and then also those 12 million mineral owners, what, how much they've deposited to all the local banks and driven the local economy, the agriculture for years. So you do have a lot of people out there that have a very strong interest in what's going on in your county. Thanks. Yeah, Drew. Drew Kramer. Uh, this is Drew Kramer with Tri-State Generation and Transmission Association out of Denver. A uh, few things. First, the question about mining. Um, it's very interesting, in Northwest Colorado, they were just awarded a joint federal and state grant uh, to study, along with some uh, academics and consultants from Utah, alternative uses for coal. Can you keep your coal mines open um, by using the product not for combustion in a power plant, but for turning it into rare earth metals, turning it into carbon fiber? Uh, there's a lot of this research going on right now. They're going to do, a, with this grant money, they're going to study the feasibility in Northwest Colorado of 
turning coal into this, you know, the feasibility of turning coal into these products, and is it, can something like that happen in a rural community like Craig, where there aren't, there's not terrific access to major transportation routes, it's a little off the beaten path, but could you have some sort of manufacturing or research center in a community like that? So that's one thing I know that's going on in mining is starting to study alternative uses for coal. Um, second thing I wanted to say, I want to give a plug for Jack and NACO, because they did a workshop event in Denver earlier this year for coal reliant communities. It was much like this event, it was reasonably sized, it was very interactive, it was team based, and Jack, I thought you, a lot of good stuff came out of that. So if you haven't been to a NACO event, I'll give a little plug for Jack, um, an unpaid plug for Jack. And this yeah, I didn't pay him. The stuff you guys put on is really helpful. Appreciate, uh, Drew. Can I, if I could echo on that too, on the advanced uses of uh, of coal, that I, I would encourage folks to to do look into that. I know I think Jeff's going to talk a little bit about that in a panel. What's going on in Utah? They're also doing a lot of that uh, in Wyoming. Uh, our team that that we worked with from Campbell County, uh, Wyoming, is really uh, tackling that as as far as kind of developing a, a research and development center for advanced uses of of coal and carbon. Uh, you know, for for a myriad of of products, uh, alternative uses of, of coal and carbon, and in Virginia, they're looking at uh, graphene, graphite, for for a, as an example of, of that too. Um, and, and just to address the the first question here too, it's a great question and a comment that 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 we get a lot of, a lot of times, and, and I think that's part of the the, the narrative that, that that we're trying to uh, to help change is that uh, yes, resource uh, extraction economy is it has been resilient across the West, but. Uh, as you said, it might not have constantly been resilient within your community or one community, and it's kind of been strong as it moves around uh, the West. Uh, and then secondly, I think it's it's not a either or, it's both and. Um, as I kind of alluded to, and uh, communities can be very proud of their resource uh, economy that they have and really push to advance that, uh, but that doesn't mean they can't be investing uh, in other opportunities uh, such as, you know, outdoor recreation or, or advanced manufacturing or entrepreneurship, tech economy. Uh, they, they, they shouldn't be pitted as, as enemies in that they can together uh, really uh, make your community uh, a strong economy and provide a lot more opportunities for, uh, for those that don't necessarily uh, want to work uh, in the resource economy for, for them to stay in your community um, or come home. I hope, hope that makes sense that uh, it, it's kind of a both and uh, and and as, as Drew knows, we talked about too, this, that's the same for, I think we'll talk about renewable and alternative energies too. Uh, it's a both and, and, and uh, that's a whole other conversation, but that, that's the same kind of narrative. Drew. Well, the last thing I had was really a question for the panel. Jack made a comment about, you know, getting people involved and not just the head economic developer in town and not just the mayor. So that was sort of my question. Um, Craig, Colorado in Northwest Colorado is a town of about 9,000 people. It's kind of the closest thing we at Tri-State have to a company town. We have a 1300 megawatt power plant there. We have a coal mine there. Um, and there are changes coming. We know we're closing at least one of the units in about five or six years. The coal mine's just been permitted for another 30 some years, but we don't know what's gonna play out there. And you know, in my observations, Craig has a lot of people involved in economic development. There's a chamber of commerce, there's a county funded tourism department. Till recently there was an economic development corporation. There's a ballot, created entity called the local marketing district it takes hotel tax and uses it for to, to fund local marketing grants so there are a lot of people focused on economic development which is good but the town's never really quite been able to coalesce around a vision or an idea you have county commissioners that come and go some are more involved in economic development others some believe it's a private sector thing only and the county shouldn't be involved you have changing personalities on the city council. So I guess my question for the panelists is anecdotally, and I know there's not one model that fits every community, but you know, your thoughts on kind of who, is there one person, is there one entity in a community that really needs to take charge and kind of be the point guard or the point person on this stuff while including everybody else? What's the proper role of government versus private sector? Just, I'd like some thoughts and um, you know, anecdotes on sort of your vision on who, who should run this stuff and how do you get a community to coalesce around a single idea or vision? Yeah, and I'll let Arvin talk a little bit about uh, the Future Forum and, and what they've done there as, a, as an example, but just in general, and, and like you said, Drew, it's, it's not any one uh, person per se that, that I would encourage as, as far as the leader, 
but I, I would say that there, there needs to be some kind of, even if it's ad hoc and not necessarily a formal group, but there needs, whether that's the county group or town group or it's larger regional base, that, that needs to meet. And again, it doesn't need to be formally meeting with minutes, uh, but just something that brings partners together. I talked about planning being important, and I mean that in an ongoing sense. Uh, planning should be constantly ongoing and checking in and not just meeting a couple of times and then putting a thing on paper and then, and then that. Uh, and, and so I would also encourage to meet people like where they are and, and if you're having trouble with getting people together to come to, to City Hall, uh, you know, whether you want to go to a brewery or something like, like that or do something at a festival or uh, a good way to get more people involved and, and, and meet people where they are as far as wanting to, to attend. And, uh, but it, there's not a specific of who it is, but there does need to be kind of one spark plug. It does help that kind of be a facilitator or champion, and then you know any kind of group that's constantly uh, meeting. Uh, just to build off of that, uh, again, we looked at a concept called the Future Forum, where we've been able to bring the four states together, the different counties, the bin different municipalities, uh, even businesses, as well as the tribes. And again, the philosophy that we followed, and again, looking at an organization that can just help coordinate that piece. But what we found is that we didn't have to dictate anything to anybody. Every community has their priority. Every community has their challenges. But what you find as you get people together and they start talking, which we found, uh, and it was a real eye opener to the four state region there, was they began to recognize they had common challenges, they had common priorities, and they had common projects that some were even working on and did not know that the next county over, or even in some cases the next municipality, were working on the same thing because they did not talk to each other. And so again, it's bringing that aspect together to where individuals will talk and what we also did was we didn't leave it just to the different governments or the chamber or etc we brought industry in also and we brought local business people in to hear their points of view and we, the one thing the one thing that we're working hard on and it's somewhat of a challenge is as indicated before by, by Jack and some of the other folks was bringing in the young people. They, I remember when I was young and I used to say the same thing, you guys forced everything on us and you made all these mistakes, now I gotta clean it up. You know, don't trust anybody over 30. Uh, you know, and again, it's, it's forging that aspect in terms of saying no, we understand that the communities that we're, the, the, the vision that we're seeing is something that you're gonna be living in. How can you contribute? Help us understand what you're looking at so that as we begin to plan, we can begin to include that or incorporate that in. And more importantly, there's a dialogue between us and you so that you can begin to understand what we're up against and what the challenges are and how do we work through those challenges. So the Future Forum has been an opportunity for us to really explore this piece and work through this piece. Have there been ups and downs? Yes. Have there been challenges throughout the process? Yes. The biggest piece, again, is building the relationship. You get people looking at each other and saying, Do, can I trust them? Are they gonna steal my project? Are they going to take advantage of us? And again, it's working through those aspects and finding ways that communities begin to see that as a concerted group, the whole is much stronger than the sum of its parts. And you begin to find that as you begin to work on this. And that's what we're seeing now in our broadband project, in our petrochemical project, in some of our work-related projects, even our food hubs and what we're trying to do in bringing that together in, in the uh, four states region. So again, those are things that we're working on. We're seeing some good benefits coming from it and we're learning as we're going. But the big piece is, as you begin to do this, you start bringing other people in so suddenly they begin to see that, yes, I own this little restaurant out here, but you know, 
I can be a part of economic development. I can be a part of downtown revitalization. I can be a part of outdoor recreation. They begin to see their part in the bigger picture. And when you begin to do that, you start seeing more participation within the communities towards this effort. Do you have something? Great. Kevin? Yeah. Well, just, I guess just one quick comment Daniel, on, that, on that question. Nothing unites like a common enemy or a common challenge. And so if you can find the people that are most affected by that one challenge, get them in the room together. In, in our instance, that was childcare. And so our school system was really struggling with having teachers. Their teachers weren't coming to school. I mean, they wouldn't say yes to take a job because they didn't have childcare our county workers, and our city. And so we got the three entities, the school district, the city, and the county to come together. They formed a nonprofit, and boom, they opened a 200 child, 200 child, uh, child care facility. Because it was, and you can't have too many people involved. You have to have the people that are the, the game changers. You want to take, um, take input from a lot of people, but then when you're actually making the decisions, get, get it to a group of three to five, you know, and those are the ones that are, will be putting in the money, and then go from there. That's kind of one of my thoughts on that. Hi, my name is Heidi Kokar. I'm the executive director of Rural Development Initiatives in the Pacific Northwest. We're a nonprofit that's been serving rural communities in Oregon um, and also Washington and Idaho for 27 years. And we, what I will say is, um, we are one of six hubs that does the the, net, the wealth work. So we're one of the wealth works hubs, and. One of the things I think we had already, I think, related to the WealthWorks Hub, and I wonder if what you think about it, has to do with the, the capacity of the local people and to not only see themselves as economy builders, like you said, um, Arvin, I think understanding that you almost don't have the privilege in a rural community to not be an economy builder. Um, this just, there's, that's just part of it. Um, but also in the capacity needed by those to, to invest in the building of the capacity of those people to work together to, for that social capital, um, to connect with one another, but also to connect with, with the understanding that they, they may have the innovative solution that the rest of us are all looking for, but they're doing all their work in isolation without the, the benefit of peers. Um, anyway, I just wonder what you think related to leadership development, related to capacity building of the local people to engage in their own economy building and their own action. I'll take a first stab at that. Um, my predecessor who did this job for 22 years was really big on, um, he integrated with uh, Extension and they have different programs for leadership. And I think it's if we can have, if you have 10 good part-time leaders, I think it's 10 times better than having one professional leader. Because if you have a strong hockey club board, if you have a strong, um, you know, housing community, all of these different things. If that, that is how you get a strong community. I mean, you can, you can get the highest paid you know, mayor to come to town who knows all of the things, and that community is not going to survive. And so next week, we're sponsoring, it's called Lead Local. It's just a one-day training for people who want to become more familiar with parliamentary procedure, working with different, um, different personality styles so that they are more comfortable saying yes when a board position comes available. And, and that's just kind of the culture that I came into with my community and I'm just trying to continue to push that because that, I, from my perspective, that's where change gets made is when you have a bunch of strong mid-level mid leaders. And to add to that too, looking both at the communities and the individuals working in that leadership aspect so that each begins to recognize their role, whether it's in the region or whether it's within a team. People have a tendency to forget about that. And finding their role or their niche within a particular area as you look at leadership and as you look at uh, community development. Because again, there are very successful communities in every region. And everybody looks that, to that community and says, I want to be like them, or I want to do just like they're doing. But what we're beginning to push as we talk through the future forum process is that everybody has a role. And so as you become successful in your role to help support this other community, 
you, in essence, begin to see benefits for your own community, much like an individual. And the analogy I've always used in our area, because basketball is really big, is I, I used the basketball analogy. I said, you know, I played basketball uh, throughout when I was younger. I played at all the Indian tournaments you could count on out there. And sometimes you go into a, a, a tournament and you have only four guys made it or maybe three guys made it. The other guys are coming from work or whatnot. So you look up in the bleachers, you find two people, you say, come on, let's go. You bring them together and for that first quarter, you guys, we, we play lousy because we don't know how each other plays. We don't understand the strengths and the weaknesses of each member. But as we progress through the game, we get better and better because now we know who the defensive person is, who can do the rebounds, who can shoot, who can drive and, and get into different areas and pass off. We begin to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each member of that team so that by the end of the game, we're beginning to gel and we're beginning to produce. Much like you as within a community and as you look at a number of communities, what's your role? in those areas and how can you build on the strengths of each other in order to achieve success, whatever that success may be for your given region. That's what we're beginning to find out with the future form process. That's another sports metaphor for the list there. <laughs> Just quickly, I'll add to that and I can talk to you afterwards. Um, Virginia's got a great example, obviously I know not in the West of uh, some community coaching and a really young leaders development program uh, in the Southwest part of the state, which was uh, manufacturing and, and coal and tobacco challenged. Uh, so they had a whole restructuring initiative from uh, from the state and the Department of Housing and Community Development, but in order to help make that transition happen, they have a state employee from the Department of Housing and Community Development who's kind of embedded in the whole region as a kind of master facilitator and works with obviously tons of other partners, uh, but really have, they've done some awesome work in, in kind of rallying communities together for, for leadership training, um, et cetera. So I can get with you afterwards for, for more details. But. Uh, yeah, Annette Leba with the Governor's Office in Oregon. Daniel, my question is for you. I really appreciate you bringing up housing. It is a challenge that we see pretty much everywhere. Um, and, uh, and also childcare for that matter. But um, to focus on housing, I'm interested in understanding a little bit more about how the county subsidy works. Um, and then a related question, are you seeing workforce challenges? I would imagine that a lot of people who have construction related skills could be working um, in other sectors making more money. So how are you addressing that piece as well? It's, it's a challenge, I mean, because some of our builders, they come from two hours away, two and a half hours away, and they are scared to bring their employees out to our community because oil companies come to the work sites and they start passing out, oh, how much are you making? You want to make $5 an hour more? Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it's about 30% more to be building in our community than other parts of our state because of that fact. And, um, and so we've had lots of people thinking about, you know, how can, we, how can we change this? Do we provide housing if you are working in the trades, you know, so that they can stay here, but then they have to prompt, but it's hard because it's like you can't prom make them promise, okay, you must work for this housing contractor, you can't get a job, it's hard. Um, and so, but yeah, so I mean, I can show you a little bit more specifically all of the application, but it's pretty much if a builder will commit to building a single family house, three bedroom, two car, garage, two bath, um, on a smaller lot, we're trying to emphasize efficiency in um, infrastructure. So a smaller in size lot, we will, at closing, um, incentivize the process so that it makes it worth it for the builder and then it also it makes it better for the buyer as well um, to, in order for to just to get increase the supply there's a lot of um, home purchasing agreements but there's not or programs but not a lot that incentivize the supply of housing well so it's it's a forgivable five-year um, Loan. So as long as they live there for five years, they don't have to pay anything back. And if they, if they sell it at a profit within those five years, we'll ask for a percentage of it back. Right. But if they sell it at a loss, then we won't ask for any of it back. So Daniel, I, f I found it uh, resonant uh, when you were saying kind of at the end of the day, 
uh, when it's really kind of down to brass tacks, you need that team of three to five people to sort of drive change. Uh, when I started at, at Western Governors uh, Association, I was reading these uh, books on change agency, and, and uh, there was one in particular that had just a few simple rules, and one of them was, no matter what your organization is or what its size is, you should have a board of three to five people, whether it's GM or a little local nonprofit, because it's going to be three to five people who do all the work, and if you're at a board with 40 people, it's easy to hide. Uh, and I, I love that idea, and I would have embraced, embraced it, but I couldn't figure out which 15 governors I was going to tell couldn't be on my board anymore. <laughs> so uh, we've run out of time on this panel. Let's give our uh, panelists uh, a hand. And we're going to do just a very quick transition. We're going to ask our next panelist to, to join us here. We're just going to uh, not take a break, but just have a five-minute transition here. Thank you. <laughs>